not everybody, I guess, but I guess we could just continue to do this weekly if that's what everybody wants to do. But he has me to do this here this third Sunday of the month as we fall in love with Jesus again. And um, I guess there's two words there. And uh, well, three maybe fall in love in Jesus, but I, I, I hit on love. So. Um, and I don't have a single note. I wrote down a couple of verses in my pocket. But the one is the love chapter. I don't even know if I, I'm not going to read all of them. Uh, what Michelle say? Read them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got a Bible. It's the King James Bible. And it, it's, it's the love chapter. I guess read it. I'm not a very good reader. I'll tell you what I'll do. Oh, I'll have participation. And Michelle's a good reader, so I'm going to have her read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And she's going to read it out of the King James, and it won't say love in there at all. Sure. You want me to? Yes. Want me to hear the whole chapter? Go for it. <laughs> Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, we see through a glass darkly, but then, face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known, as also I am known. And now abide it, faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. And most every, not most, but a lot of them that I looked up, um, other versions of the Bible, or interpretations, they always use the word love. And um, it even says here, at the beginning of the chapter 13, it says, Faith, hope, and love is what in the Bible here says, but then in parentheses it says charity. So, and if you look up the word charity, it didn't mean to me. Definition goes to you know thinking of the poor, but then I got to thinking about the Lord as He looked down on us, you know, and we are poor with nothing and have no love unless we have the Lord. And, um, then I got to thinking about the word love and uh, how we love things, at least we as humans say we do, you know, and like food. You know, it's always a good one with me. Boy, do I love deer steak and fried potatoes, you know. Radford loves Diet Coke. And <laughs> but he's gone away from that maybe as well. Just a little. <laughs> but there is, you know, everybody loves different things, as they say. Music. I love that song. You know, what does that mean? It's just a song. But it does. It might touch your heart. And in a way that you say you love it. But then, you know, we go to um, our families and we 
love our families. Uh, we, you know, put your life down. This word says would be the greatest thing would be to you know, put your life down for your brother or your sister or your friend. And um, but it's hard to imagine how much you know people that have their kids and their grandkids how much you love them. It's uh, it's unreal. Um, and uh, also, then, you know, even above that, we should love our wives and our husbands, our spouses. And um, there, I thought it was just another thing that was told to a fellow one time, and he told me that um, his boss told him that the, his job was the most important thing that he had. And he said, I told him, he said, that. My job is an important thing, he said, but it is not the most important thing. And he said, you know, he has his family and he has his wife, he said, which, you know, was a great thing for him to put out there because his boss was not a Christian man, but he said, the thing that is most important to me, to me, is my relationship with the Lord. And, um, and that should be what it is. We fall, fall into all kinds of things through our life. And um, things that we love in this earth, and, but we should always turn back to the love of the Lord. And uh, that, that just popped in there in the wrong spot. But anyhow, we love our spouses. And uh, Kim and I, we've always tried to, you know, because we love each other, we always, you know, we want to put the Lord first in our life. And um, everything has its own. Time and as it, things go on, we've been married 35 years, and our first five years, you know, we won't be in Barbie, as they say, you get to the first five years of marriage, everything is smooth. From there on, it gets better, but I don't know about all that. But uh, it is better, most definitely better, uh, and um, as your love grows for one another. But uh, we're to love the Lord. Um, says, Kim, you get to read this one since I said maybe shall we read that. Uh, First John. Okay. Just memorize it. <laughs> First John 419. I'll put you on the spot. First John four nineteen. Oh. 
Because, you know, as the theme of falling in love with Jesus again, sometimes the church, and I'll say the church, because I have to speak to the church. I can't change the world other than preaching the gospel, but I can teach and preach the word of God and allow him, allow his word to change us. But so many times the church, if we look at the Old Testament, when the Bible speaks of Israel, many times, and I'm not saying always, but many times, that is a, a reference to the church of today. Now, I believe there's some things in Scripture that are Israel-specific, okay? Like what we're reading right now, we're going through in the book of Ezekiel. Hello, in Bible study. Uh, some of those things are Israel-specific, okay? However, many times in the Old Testament, we find when God speaks to the nation of Israel, He's also speaking to us as the church. This book, if you've never read it, I, like I said, I do encourage you to do it because this book of Hosea is, to me, has always been an intriguing story, but it's been one of those that you're like, what? I'll just say that. Because, and I'm not going to read all these scriptures because that's not the point. I encourage you to go read them. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing or understanding by the Word of God. Hosea, now... A righteous man loved God. And in the first chapter of the book of Hosea, God tells Hosea, a man of God now, to marry a prostitute. <laughs> Hello. I do not suggest that for anybody else. Okay, let me just say. This was a specific direction to the man Hosea. God is not telling everyone to go out and marry a prostitute, okay? Please know that. But God tells him to marry this woman for a reason. Because this was representative of God and Israel. Because Israel had lost her ways and had given herself to other gods, to foreign gods. And God was upset with the nation of Israel. Now, we all like to say, and I absolutely believe that God loves us all. But can I tell you that God sometimes gets upset with us? <laughs> now, now, please, God's love is, is unconditional and it is never ended. Correct? Yes. But the Bible says, he whom he loves, he also chastises or punishes. Or in other words, any of you growing up get a spanking and your parents said, this is hurting me more than it's hurting you. And you're thinking at the time, no it's not. <laughs> you know, I, I had, I'm not going to say I had more than my share. I had my share of spanking. I probably had more than you did. Can I just say that? Because, but I, I will say I deserved every one of them. Okay? I was a little kid, little punk kid growing up. And I deserved every spanking I got. Because I was just... Back then, back then, we just didn't do time out. And time out just didn't work for me. Okay? You know, my brother, he'll tell you this, that he could... All he had, all Dad had to do was say something to him, and he'd start the little crocodile tears, and Dad would let him off. It failed him later in life. Me, bring it on. <laughs> but sometimes God gets upset and frustrated with us. Doesn't mean He doesn't love us, but He does. Chastise or correct, not punish. There's a, yeah, there's a difference between punishment and correction. Okay? Punishment is designed purely for your pain. Okay? Am I right? Punishment is designed for your pain. Correction is designed to change your path. If you're, you know, angels have 
have satellite or GPS or on your phone or whatever, and you make the wrong turn, and that irritable woman comes on. A lot of them used to be. I don't know how they are now. But sometimes that voice would come on. Turn around. Redirect. Change. Turn around. Rude woman. <laughs> but the purpose was to get you to change course, to get on the right road. And so when God corrects us, it's not designed for our pain, it's designed for our changing, so that we get back to where we're supposed to be. So I'm telling you, I used to tell a friend of mine, you weren't beating us as a child. <laughs> Some need it more than others. Can I just say that? But here's the nation of Israel who had gone off and decided to do what they wanted to do. Serve other gods. Worship. And, and when I say serve, I mean they worshiped other gods. They sacrificed to these gods. They bowed down to these other gods. And God says, I don't like that. In fact, one part of the Ten Commandments is, I am God. I'm just paraphrasing it. You worship me only. And however, even in this modern day, us sometimes, we tend to make idols out of things that shouldn't be idols in our life. Can I tell you, it's not wrong to have money. However, it's wrong for money to have you. See the difference? It's not wrong to have things but it's wrong for things to have you. If something is hindering you and your walk with God, if something stops you or blocks you or takes up time that God only deserves, it's an idol. Ouch. You can sure say ouch, not amen. <laughs> Anything that gets in the way of our relationship with God is sin. You're awful quiet today. <laughs> I don't know if it's the weather or if it's just ouch. But and, and please, I'm not judging. I'm guilty. Of, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. I'm guilty of it all. Okay, and so are you. But anything that comes in place of God, anything that that takes your devotion away from God Himself is sin. Don't hear that word in church a lot. Sin, you know, <gasps> you know. But, but can I tell you, sin still exists. That's why there was still a need for Jesus. If there was no need for Jesus, if there was no, if there was no sin, Jesus would, you know, we all be gone. Let's go back to heaven. Let's go. Hello, I'm looking for that day. But as long as the devil is here on this earth, and as long as he is tempting and trying people. There will still be sin, and there will still be need for Jesus. But the nation of Israel, just like us, tends to get distracted at times. Do we not? We get distracted. Our, our, our things in our life kind of pull us away. And, and it doesn't always happen at once. You know, remember the, the story of the frog. You don't put a frog in boiling water or it will jump out. A live frog, you put him in. But if you put him in slowly and turn the heat up, he'll get used to it, get used to it. You see, it doesn't always happen, it doesn't happen all at once, but it can over time. We let a little in, we let a little in, we let a little in. Before we know it, we're stuck in it. It's become our way of life. It's become the norm for us. And sometimes we don't even realize how we got there, but we got there. The nation of Israel, it's oh, it's okay if we do this. And it's okay if we do another thing. And, and before they knew it, they were serving other gods. Wrong. So God told Hosea, to marry this prostitute. And somebody says, well, that, 
That's offensive. Why would God do that? But you know what? How much more offensive is it, the fact that the church, the people of God, sometimes give up God and go serve other idols? That's offensive to me. God tells Hosea to marry this woman as a symbol of what had happened with the nation of Israel and also with the church. Now in this process, and I'm not going through the whole thing, they have three children. And all of their names, that's why I encourage you to go read it, all of their names mean something. Their first child was named Jezreel. Jezreel, now get this, was a city where Ahab and Jezebel committed murders. 1 Kings 21, you look for that. So God was saying through, this, through their, their first child that the nation of Israel has murdered people. Can I tell you there are murders happening every day around the world, but especially in the United States? Do you think God's happy with it? Someone asked me this morning, and I, I, it's a good question. What about all these mass shootings? Horrible. M murder is one of the Ten Commandments that we do not break. Didn't, see, we say kill, but kill and murder are two different things. If I'm in the military and I have to go out and kill somebody, that's not breaking the Ten Commandments. Okay? It's murder. We have murders, mass murders, people shooting up places. We have, now get this, we have drunk drivers out here that are driving and having accidents and killing people. To me, that's murder. We have drug addicts that are so needing another fix that they will murder a convenience store person just to get money or something that they can turn around and sell to get money for, to get more drugs. And leading a pack of all this is the murders that we have with unborn children. Leading the pack. There are more children murdered than all the other stuff combined. God, I'll, I'll just say this, God is not happy with the nation of America. God does not like what he sees in our schools and in our churches. Please, I'm getting us some good stuff. I'm just laying the groundwork, okay? God is not pleased with the nation of the United States. Because what we have done we have allowed murder on many different areas, and it offends the nostrils of God. Yeah, it does. <laughs> How does this apply to falling in love with Jesus again? We'll get to this, okay? The first child was named Jezreel because that was a place where many murders took place by the hand of Ahab and Jezebel, his queen. Their second child, their daughter, was named Lo-Ruhamah. It's in verses, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Now get this. Ruhamah means mercy, or more specifically, tender mercy. Okay? But... It actually, now get this, you're going to like this, it literally means womb. Wow. However, when you add low in front of it, it becomes no mercy. God was getting upset because of their actions of serving other gods because they had allowed murders. God said, I have no mercy for you. Ouch. Now, I'm going to get to good stuff. I promise you. 
You're doing good already. Oh, what's that? Thank you, but I'm going to get some happy stuff. Maybe that's a better term. But God was so upset with the nation of Israel, and I, let me just say this. God is upset with the church that I believe there's coming a time when he's going to say, no mercy. Strong words, people. Strong words, church. See, God doesn't do anything by accident. He marries this woman. They have children. Everything is in God's plan because God wants to teach the nation of Israel and thus the church today a lesson. He wants to get us back on path. Their third child was a son, and he was called Lo-Ami, A-M-M-I. You find that in verses 8 and 9. This name, not the, oh, this name literally means not my people. God and his righteous anger. Can, can I tell you God has righteous anger? saw a nation that had abandoned God and allowed things to happen, it had progressed to the point where not only did he say, I will have no mercy on them, he said to the nation of Israel, I have, no, you are not my people any longer. <gasps> Israel had gotten to the state where God was so upset and he says, I'm disowning you. Now, as parents, you understand it takes something extremely terrible or a series of terrible events if you would ever say that to your own child. Am I right? It would take a lot. If you're a good parent, it would take a lot for you to say, I, they're not mine. Now, sometimes we joke about that. That's not my kid, you know. Sometimes I say, it's not my church. <laughs> but we sometimes, it takes a lot and a lot and a lot for you to just own somebody, someone that you really absolutely loved. Not someone you just met who really cares, but someone that you love. For you to turn your back and say, I'm not even related to them. We have this joke in our family where we know, I, I, when, when my one aunt says, to my mom, your brother. That means she doesn't own that. She, she has disowned that one brother. Because it's not her brother any longer. It's just my mom's brother. Sometimes God gets that frustrated with us. Sometimes God gets to the place where he's like, I don't know what I'm going to do with it, so to speak. I mean, God knows, but here. Where God is so frustrated with you and me that he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know. He wants to spank you, or he wants to do something else, or he wants. God, God will judge his church. How do I know? Because according to Hebrews, it says, judgment begins in the house of God. And if judgment begins in the house of God, where shall the unrighteous and the sinner appear? Hello. If God, who says that he loves, and I believe absolutely does, love his church, but if he has to judge us and punish us, excuse me, correct us, how much more is the sinner and the ungodly going to get? Think, think of that. God saw the state of the nation of Israel and said, I will have no pity or no mercy on you, and now I am going to disown you. And he's, God's trying to speak. I remember when we started out the book of Ezekiel, and through so many chapters, Ezekiel gave visual lessons on what the word of the Lord was. Did he not? 
He had to lay in front of a place for a bunch of days. And he had to do it. So God sometimes uses visual aids to help us to learn a lesson. Well, that's what he did with Jose. Marry this woman, have three kids. And through that, God was trying to say something. Because Hosea, look at this, was a righteous man and he was a spokesperson for God. Sometimes I don't like people outside of church to know I'm a preacher. Why? Because when I make a mistake, when I mess up, when I don't do the right thing sometimes, I don't want someone to say, well, he's a preacher, you should know better. It happens, okay? Because I'm not perfect. I'm just like you are. So sometimes I don't like that. But can I tell you, I don't want to say most of the time, but I hope most of the time, when people listen to me, I hope they're listening to me as a spokesperson for God. When people listen to you, I hope they're hearing you as a spokesperson for God. Ooh, ouch. If, you, if, if we can understand that, a lot of things may change in our life. Things that we say and things that we do may change. But as a spokesperson for God, Hosea, everything he was doing was based upon God wanting to speak to Israel. And they rebelled, and they rebelled, and they rebelled, and they rebelled against God. God, see, God did not want this to happen. And he didn't want this to continue because God is a God of love. And the whole time he was doing these things and showing and, and giving these examples, he was saying to Israel, I want you back. I don't want you to serve other idols. I don't want you to fall down and worship these gods. Because they're lifeless. I am God. I am the only God. That's what he was trying to tell these people. I, he was trying to tell Israel, I've always been by your side. Have I not? Listen, church, has God not always been by your side? And everything that he's done, every, everything he's done in your life, has the purpose of bringing you to him. Before, during, how many times when you did not believe and did, did not trust in Jesus Christ and His saving blood for your salvation, did God spare your life? Did God bring you out of something? How many times before you even acknowledged Him was He working on your behalf? Yes, He was. How many times now that we, when we don't even realize it, when sometimes we're going in our own way, is is our good shepherd not reaching out with his staff with the hook on it and hooking you by the neck and saying, come back. He still does it to this day. To every one of us. He pulls us and he says, learn from me. Let me show you. You see, a lot of people don't realize that that shepherd's staff had two purposes. That hook was to draw the sheep in. But the other side of that was for beating off the wolves. Can I tell you, God is working on your behalf behind the scenes now that you don't even know about it. God is beating off wolves on your behalf even now. Hello! Even now, God is saying, I am driving away the we believe the Lord's Prayer. We don't want to fall, let the, let the evil one tempt us even. God is out there beating off the enemy for, you, for your behalf because he loves you. That was the purpose of this, this story from Hosea. The purpose of what God was doing here was God was trying to get Israel to say, sorry God, let's, we're going to turn back to you. 
And if you, I'm going to jump to the last chapter, Hosea chapter 14. Look at this in verse 1. He says, O Israel, I, I want you, I don't want you, I don't want to just read through this. I want you to hear it as if God is saying it himself. I want you to hear it as if it's coming from God's heart. Listen to this. He says, O Israel, return to the Lord your God. For you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity. Receive us graciously, for we will offer the sacrifices of our lips. Look at that. Assyria, the prophet Isaiah was speaking on the Lord's behalf, said that Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses. Now look at this. Nor will we say any more to the works of our hands, you are our gods. Look at that. Your, the work of your hands is not your God. God, yeah. God, he's good. You see, what is the works of your hands? Anything built by man. Several years ago, I had this, this guy, it was right before Christmas. You know when they put on those early, early Black Friday sales? He went out and it was a deal and got this, I don't know, 60, 70 something inch, huge TV. And he already had it pretty nice when he began. But it was on sale. So he went out and bought it. Middle of the month, he comes to me and says, um, I need food. I don't have any food in my house. He had kids. He said, I have no food in my house. You know what I did to him? I told him, I said, eat your TV. <laughs> That's the work of his hands. Do you understand what I mean? Because let me tell you, food is more important than a huge TV. Yeah. But that's the work of our hands. And so many times, whether it be a TV or a car or, or a house or whatever, so many times people, and maybe not you, maybe something else, hear me? But so many times the works of our hands, we put so much love into that that we're basically saying, you are my God. What he's saying here, he's saying, no longer will we say to the works of our hands, you are our gods. The prophet goes on to say, for in you, he's talking about God, the fathers finds mercy. He goes on what I read at the beginning, I will, God says, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger is turned away from him. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall grow like a lily and lengthen a truth like Lebanon. His branches shall spread. His beauty shall be like an olive tree and his fragrance like Lebanon. Those who dwell under his shadow shall be returned. They shall be revived like grain and grow like a vine. Their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Verse 9 says, Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but transgressors, transgressors stumble. The whole time God has sent Israel, come back to me. Fall in love with me again. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying today to the church of, of Jesus Christ. Not Latter-day Saints, but the church of Jesus Christ. He's saying to the church, come back, fall in love with me again. I don't want you to be out there. I want you to come under my shadow. Shadow of his wings, the Bible talks about. I want you to come under my protection. I want you to come under my blessing. I want your roots to grow. I want your trees to flourish. I want to bless you. You know what God's looking at? He says, I want to bless you. Give me the opportunity. Fall in love with me again. So many times, 
through the Old Testament, we see. Israel loved the Lord, then they didn't. They served other gods. Then they loved the Lord, and they served, then they fell and served other gods. It was a constant roller coaster with the nation of Israel. Hello, church. <laughs> Hello, church. I, I struggle sometimes with people that come to church, not here necessarily, but when people come to church and one day they love the Lord with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then the next day, eh. now I now get it. We're human, and some days we're just more vibrant, it seems like. Some days we're just, I love Jesus. Yes, I do. I love Jesus. How about you? Some days we're there, and then some days we're like, I'm going to heaven, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. <laughs> we're more like that, okay? We're like that. So I believe the church, and that's why this is why we need to be reminded, okay, to fall in love with Jesus. Because sometimes we just get complacent. And if we get complacent, we tend to look other places. When we become satisfied, we tend to look. Oh, this looks good, that looks good. And before we know it, given enough time, if we're not careful, we're looking at other gods. Remember the story of Samson and Delilah? Samson, strong man of God, from birth, dedicated to the work of the Lord. And slowly by slowly, Delilah enticed him to tell the secret. Some people have too many Delilahs. They pull them away from God. That's why we need reminded, all of us, me included, we need reminded to fall in love with Jesus again. To turn our hearts and go back and look at Him. I want to love Jesus more today than I ever have in my life. I want you to love Jesus today more than you ever have in your life. And God's saying, I want you. I, I know I said I'm not going to have mercy on you. I know I even said I, you're not even my people anymore. He disowned them. But God in his mercy calls us back. Calls us back to him. And says, I love you. I love you. Read verse 4 again because I think it's so powerful. God says, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. Friend, that's what God wants for you today. God wants to love you, He wants to heal you, He wants to love you freely, and He wants you to love Him back. Bow your heads for a moment. Maybe this is you today. You feel like, you know what? This is what we've been talking about, but today it hit home. Today it hit home. I've allowed myself to be enticed to go up another way. Or I'm in the process. It's happening to me right now. Friend, I want to ask you today. Do you know that God loves you? Do you know that His mercy is abounding towards you? As, as the scripture says, His mercy endures forever to all generations. Friend, I'm asking you today, if you're that person, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because this is between you and God. Sometimes that's good to do, raise your hand or what? I'm not asking you. I'm asking right now for Holy Spirit to step in and do what I can do. I'm asking him to step in into your heart right now and speak to you. And he's going to show you if you give him the opportunity. He will show you where. But God loves you. And he's drawing you back. He did not want to condemn you. 
He's not looking to punish you. God takes no delight in that. What he wants is to correct you, to bring you back. So as we're, as we're here right now, I'm just asking you, is that you? And if that is you, I want you to run after God. Repent and run after God and tell him that you're sorry. Because God is running after you, friends. God is running after you. And God loves you. And he wants to show mercy on your life. And he wants to bless you. Why should you settle for less when God gives you so much? Father, I'm just, as I'm standing here today, you know the heart of each individual here today. I'm just asking you, God, do a work in their heart. Show them. If they're thinking, I'm okay, show them. God, do something that makes us fall in love with you again. Show us where we've erred and draw us back. Don't condemn us or judge us, but show mercy on us, God. Show mercy on your church today, God. Show mercy on this nation and draw us back to you. God, that we would be that people who is your people. We would be your people and you would be our God. Help us to serve you and to run after you and not after other gods. So Father, do that work through your spirit in each of our lives. All of us. In the matchless name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. amen. A pilgrim was I and a wandering. In the cold night of sin I did roam. When Jesus, the kind shepherd, found me. Good.